Hello, this video takes a swift but stunningly insightful look at King Duncan, the monarch who reigns over Scotland at the start of Macbeth, Shakespeare's classic tragedy. Now, like all of us, there's shades of great at this lad. You know, he's a, a mix of flaws and merits. I mean, there's moments in the play where his grace and his nobility pour out. And then there's the times he comes across as a thundering great Wally. Uh, a guy you could argue is responsible for his own death. A guy you could argue is practically placing the knife in Macbeth's hand. Now, in terms of the structure of the play, the structure of a tragedy, Duncan's character is very significant because he helps to establish very early doors Macbeth's high status character. A tragic hero, like Macbeth, like Othello, like King Lear, that Johnny's got to be a noble, charismatic character at the start. You know, somebody who commands respect, and that makes the fall of that character all the more dramatic. In Act 1, Scene 2, you've got the captain telling Duncan just what a right rollicking toughy, a one-man fighting machine, Macbeth was, and sticking it to the Norwegians. And Duncan pipes up, doesn't he? Oh, valiant cousin, noble gentleman, so the captain and Duncan act like a tag team promoting Macbeth's prowess as a soldier and Duncan comes across very clearly in act one as a fair and just king I mean he can be ruthless when necessary but he also gives credit where credit's due he doesn't mess about in act one I mean the original thing of Cordor is a traitor and there's no prospect of a rehabilitation program you know he's not packed off his cord to some holiday camp to have a long hard think about what he's done. None of that touchy-feely flim flam from Donkey Babes. Not this week, no. Use for the chop, Cordor my beamish boy. But then again, Duncan lavishes praise and gifts on Macbeth and Banquo for their heroism in the army. You know, he's very kind to Banquo. He enfolds him to his heart and uh, he talks about Macbeth. He says he loves him highly. He's quite a sentimental old booby, really. Another thing about Duncan is that he comes across as a genuinely well-respected noble king. And ironically, this is more apparent after the old boy dies. I mean, even Macbeth talks of Duncan's silver skin laced with his golden blood. And of course, those precious metals, silver and gold, with their connotations of value, they help to convey the importance, the high status of Duncan in this play. In fact, so integral to the stability of society is Duncan that when he dies, Nature itself is plunged into chaos. You've got day and night get blurred, and uh, great seeing this. Just a throwaway line in Act 2, an old boy reports that Duncan's horses ate each other. Don't forget, in the Jacobean era, the social hierarchy is fixed, and fixed by God. You might have heard that term, the chain of being. So if you murder a king, that's a gross violation of the order of the universe. Society, the natural world, the religious world, they're all interconnected. And it's a measure of Duncan's power and his stature that when he dies, the whole world goes berserk. I talked before about how Duncan works on a structural level to establish Macbeth's heroism in the structure of a dramatic tragedy. Uh, you've also got another way that his character operates structurally uh, as a contrast or as a character to juxtapose with Macbeth, just to get a measure of Macbeth's performance as a king. Now, Duncan is used to magnify Macbeth's inability to rule with style and competence. Uh, Macbeth, you know, he can't kill off his enemies properly, can he? Flee on fleas. And uh, I mean, that feast he has, that's supposed to show him as a classy, dignified king. But do you know what? It ends up as an utter shambles. So you juxtapose, you compare Duncan and Macbeth and it only serves to reflect badly on Macbeth. Alas, for all Duncan's premium grade personal properties, there is a fair bit of counterweight, a fair few faults that you can pin on this man. And the first is perhaps more forgivable than the second. Let's look at the first one though. He's quite naive, he's quite easily fooled is this man. Don't forget he's tricked by two things of Cordor, the original and Macbeth. They both turn out to be treacherous little weasels and he doesn't detect that. I mean, he ruefully admits, doesn't he? There's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. Translation, it's hard to know, it's hard for Duncan to know, what people are really thinking. But you could argue that Shakespeare lays on some dramatic irony to heighten this sense of Duncan's ignorance. Dramatic irony, uh, that's when we know something a character doesn't. And in it, Act 1, Scene 6, uh, it's quite a short scene, Duncan rocks up at Macbeth's castle just after uh, we, the audience, have heard Macbeth and his wife plan to kill him. Now, the old bozo has no idea, and he says, This castle hath a pleasant seat. The air sweetly recommends itself. 
Now, one of the byproducts or effects of dramatic irony, it gives the viewer a sense of superiority, a privileged position of knowledge over the character. And maybe I'm judging Duncan a little bit too harshly, but he does come across here as a little bit gullible, a little bit credulous, a little bit easy to deceive. By my book, by my book, it makes all the others suck. Pages turn and you will learn in the exam how much you'll earn. I'll stop right there. You're not doing me a solid buying this book, believe me. You are, however, doing yourself a massive favour. If you've got this far into the video, you're clearly not a Muppet, and you can probably see why a collection of level 9 standard Macbeth essays will be a big beefy boost to revision. Make the right decision. Do you remember we said Duncan's a little bit naive? Well, do you know what? That's small fry. That's a minor misdemeanour. His major league mistake in this play is overseeing of actively fostering this regime or society where bloodshed is linked to status. Let's go back to our one scene too. You've got that tag team with the captain and Duncan praising Macbeth's performance in battle. Duncan's verdict is significant. He calls Macbeth, oh valiant cousin, noble gentleman. Gentleman, with its connotations of high status. That suggests that guys like Macbeth affirm or validate their sense of self, their sense of masculinity, through acts of eye-watering violence. I mean, the captain says, doesn't he, Macbeth, that he practically hacks some dude in two. My argument, then, is that Duncan is a bit like Dr. Frankenstein. Dr. Frankenstein created a monster. And Duncan created a monster. He shaped Macbeth into this stone-cold killer machine whose simple mathemat mathematics read violence equals power. Hey, violence equals power. That got in the gig of saying a cordo, didn't it? He's got a taste for power and he knows only one way to go about it at the business end of a blade. I mean, when I watch the play, I almost want to yell at Duncan. Donkey babes, join the dots, lad. Your man Macbeth, he's got a taste for power and a taste for blood. Have a guess where that ends. Do you want to know Mr. Taylor's superpower? Well, if he's singing, leaves something to be desired. You can't fault his ability to summarise a video in clear, concise prose. Have a read of this if you're so inclined. And we're done. We've taken King Duncan, that funky monkey donkey, and we've analysed him to within an inch of his life. I'm off to practice my singing, buy my book, buy my book, otherwise we're finished. Or as you say in French, new sums finis. All the best in that exam hall.